Mr. Peterson's living his life, probably thinking about whether to grill or barbecue this weekend, when BAM! Mrs. Peterson drops the bombshell that their family tree might just have a few unexpected branches. Their 22-year-old daughter, LaJoya Jackson, might have more dads in the mix than a sitcom from the 90s. Mrs. Peterson, in a plot twist worthy of a soap opera marathon, reveals a blast. From her past in the form of an affair right around the time LaJoya was conceived, but here's the kicker. She's hell-bent on proving that Mr. Peterson is the real daddy-o, turning what should be a straightforward lineage into a family bush of biblical proportions. Mr. Peterson, just one month ago, your world came crumbling down when your wife, Mrs. Peterson, revealed she had been keeping a secret. 22-year-old daughter LaJoya Jackson may not be your biological daughter. Mrs. Peterson, you admit that 22 years ago, during the window of conception, you had sex with another man, Mr. Beckham, but you want to prove today in court that Mr. Peterson is Ms. Jackson's father. Yes, Your Honor. Oh, buckle up and pop the popcorn, because Mrs. Peterson is kicking the drama up several notches to a level even reality TV might blush at. Just when you thought dinner could only be about passing the peas and dodging personal questions, she pulls a move straight out of a daytime TV special. She's not just inviting potential dads to a guess who's your daddy dinner party, she's turning the dining room into the set of a paternity test reveal, but with more appetizers. Yep, it's like being on a game show, where the grand prize is a deep dive into your family's gene pool, and the consolation prize is unlimited access to the family therapist. Who knew that family gatherings could also double as a live-action Maury Povich episode? A month ago, I was previously in court because I had a similar situation. With my child, father, with my boyfriend, I lied and told him that he was not the father. I didn't like having that between us, and I came clean to him and asked her, do you want to just go and do it so that, you know, just for my clarity, because I'm feeling some type of way. And she had never admitted that there was a possibility of one guy potentially being my father. And then I found out there were multiple guys that could possibly be my father. Just when you think it couldn't get more complicated, the court prepares to introduce Mr. Beckham, another potential father, shedding light on Mrs. Peterson's past and the complicated web of relationships that have led to the current paternity dispute. It feels like the season finale of a soap opera, where the writers have just thrown in a new character for the shock value. The courtroom holds its breath, half expecting Maury Povich to walk in with the envelope. You won't believe Mr. Beckham's story, but don't go anywhere, because what comes next is even more jaw-dropping. Would you have ever said anything if this man had not approached her a year ago? Yes, yeah, she did. Sure. She did, Your Honor. It's a potential that somebody else could be my father, because I never thought that this could happen to me. I just wake up and be like, oh, dad, make me some cereal. Not, oh, this might not be my dad. And now, if he feels as if he can't take this and I'm not his child, he can walk away at any moment. He has no ties or connections to me or my children if he's not my father. The air is so thick with tension, you could cut it with a butter knife, or, in LaJoya's case, with the sharp edges of a family tree gone wild. As she lays out her feelings of betrayal and abandonment, it's like watching someone navigate a minefield in clown shoes. Awkward, painful, but strangely captivating. When she whips out that chart of potential fathers, it's less, who's your daddy, and more, who's not your daddy, in a plot twist bingo that has everyone on the edge of their seats. The bombshell moment that follows is so shocking, it makes reality TV blush with envy. And just when you think the roller coaster has come to a stop, it lurches forward again, proving life in LaJoya's world is more twisted than a pretzel in a yoga class. When did you find out that you could potentially be her biological father? Um, I found out like about two weeks ago. She contacted me through Facebook and basically she had once told me once before that, you know, she could have been pregnant or whatever or so, but I had no move. But basically, you know, we had met at a party, you know, we was drinking, everything, there was a lot going but on. But drinking tonight. mean that you couldn't have been the father. Right, exactly. Try to pursue and seeing what was going on. Well, Basically, with at the time, I was young, I was scared. So. so when you grew up, why didn't you try to contact her like, oh, let me see what she did with the child or anything? you're not going to believe what happens next. The court proceeds to reveal the DNA test results, first clearing Mr. Beckham as the father, followed by the shocking revelation that Mr. Peterson is also not LaJoya's biological father. The news devastates the family, leaving them to grapple with their shattered relationships and identities. Meanwhile, the judge can't help but wonder if Maury Povich is available for a guest appearance to liven things up. But just when you think it's over, there's more. The next clip will leave you questioning everything you thought you knew. Mrs. Peterson say to you, I'm pregnant and you're the father. Still somewhat like that. She said it. I could be the father. You could be. You testified that you did not tell him you were pregnant. I didn't. So is he remembering the story wrong? Yes, sir. Your Honor. So he's remembering it wrong or you're remembering it wrong? Because to me, neither one of y'all got y'all story straight. 
I said that we're not liars. Neither one of us are the person that we were. I mean, I know you and grew up. And I've been your mother every then. day since then. You have been my mother, but you've been lying to me about who my father is for 22 years. In the wake of the family drama, the Petersons are hit with a twist straight out of a daytime TV show. The results are in. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Beckham, you are not her father. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Peterson, you are not her father. Oh my God, are you serious? Really, Mom? Miss Manship reveals her lifelong search for her biological father, a journey that began at age 10 when she discovered the man she believed was her father was not. She shares her exhaustive and fruitless efforts to find her biological father, Mr. Lop, including online searches and inquiries in Arkansas, where he was last known to be. This leads to the court revealing they have located Mr. Lop, who was about to meet Miss Manship and her mother for the first time in over 30 years. As if the story wasn't bizarre enough, Miss Manship humorously recounts the time she mistook a mannequin at a department store for Mr. Lop, leading to an awkward apology to a very confused sales assistant. She jokes about considering a DNA test with a suspiciously familiar-looking pizza delivery guy. There's also the time she got a lead from a psychic named Madame Fifi, who, despite her crystal ball, could only predict Miss Manship's future cat ownership, not her father's whereabouts. Just you wait. The story takes an emotional turn next. Brace yourself. The emotional roller coaster is just beginning. Miss Manship, at the age of 10, you were shocked and devastated to learn that your dad was not your biological father. That began your 20-year search to find the man your mother claims is your father. After your exhaustive search to find him, you came up with nothing. Just when you thought it couldn't get any more complicated, the focus shifts to Miss Manship's mother, Miss Lutman, who provides background on her relationship with Mr. Lop and the circumstances surrounding Miss Manship's conception and birth. This segment reveals a tangled web of relationships, assumptions, and missed opportunities for truth until the DNA test when Miss Manship was 10 years old. The story unravels like a soap opera with less amnesia and more reality checks. Miss Lutman, in a tell-all mood, spills the beans with the kind of enthusiasm usually reserved for sharing hot gossip over a fence with a neighbor. It's like unraveling a family sweater knitted with threads of intrigue, drama, and a dash of humor, thanks to Aunt Gertrude's questionable recollection of events. Hang on, the revelations from the DNA test are about to shake things up. Me and my ex got back together. About a month later, I started getting symptoms of getting pregnant. My ex, so I figured it was my ex's baby. When you found out you were pregnant, you thought it was your ex's child. I, yeah, I just figured it was my ex's because I'd be in a month later, you know, and be with him. But. And so you had the baby, and you and your ex raised the baby up until she was 10. That's when she said she was told. Yeah. And so when you got the paternity results, you immediately knew, well, if it's not my ex, it is Mr. Lop. Yes. Just as everyone starts to settle down from the high of the discovery, a distant relative, twice removed and known for crashing family gatherings, enters with a karaoke machine in tow. Looks like we're going to find out if poor dancing is the only talent running in the family. He announces, sparking a mix of excitement and dread. Mr. Lop, ever the enthusiast, sees this as a challenge and immediately starts warming up his vocal cords, which, to the surprise of many, resemble the sound of a cat in a disagreement with a vacuum cleaner. As Miss Manship braces herself for what could only be described as an epic display of inherited lack of musical talent, she can't help but think that at least life's about to get a whole lot more interesting. When he said that, your head just dropped. What are you thinking in this moment, hearing that? I'm just hoping that everything I've been told is true, because if it is, I'm the only one out there that he has, so. I've believed that he's been my father so long that I actually named my youngest son after him. You did? I did. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> I named him Dallas Trent, because I didn't want to miss the opportunity, if he was, to have, what, have one of my children have his name in it. I haven't been married I, in hopes that maybe one day I did find him, I'd have that one moment left with him. The results are in, and they're wild. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Lau, you are the father. Ready for a whirlwind of a tale that'll have you scratching your head and chuckling at the same time? So, here goes. Ms. Brown and her mom. Alicia were just chilling when out of the blue, Mr. Hampton shows up claiming to be Ms. Brown's long-lost dad. It's like something out of a mystery book, but with real people and way less pausing for dramatic effect. This whole situation kicks off a wild ride into the world of family secrets and wait, what? Moments. And trust me, it only gets wackier from here. You stand before the court with your mother, Alicia Brown, turned upside down when you were 
contacted by a man whom you've never even heard of claiming to be your birth father. Now that man, Mr. Hampton, is waiting uh, in our courtroom hallway. Just when you're catching your breath, boom, the plot thickens. Mr. Hampton swings in with a tale that sounds straight out of a movie. He's been looking for his daughter for 20 years, convinced Ms. Brown is his. The backstory with Ms. Brown's mom, total soap opera material, but with more feels and less fake gasping. I couldn't take you at the time. I had to go back to Seattle. I cried every minute on the plane. Do you have any proof of this? The, the toys first uh, bought her before, before they left, Your Honor. Jerome, hand me the evidence, please. So this is a picture, the person, Ms. Brown's birth mother. Yes, yes, Your Honor. And she's pregnant. Yes, Your Honor. Next up, Alicia Brown, AKA Kayla's adoptive super mom, grabs the mic. She's got a story that's more tangled than your headphones in your pocket. Amidst a sea of adoption papers and legal stuff, she drops a bomb about Kayla's bio dad that's juicier than a reality TV show finale. This saga's peeling off drama layers like an onion, and we're all here for the next reveal. They had me paying child support, Your Honor. Uh, they, let they, me see they, that paperwork. They knew. Jerome, that doesn't make sense. They, you were paying child support. Pay child support? They know yeah, you do have to have a paternity affidavit. Well, then they must have proved that I was your father then. The paperwork dates that there is an order for child support in Alaska and that the order names you as the father. I mean, my so mom, listen. my biological mom has, I have biological siblings that are literally consecutive years under me. Hold on to your seats because Mr. Hampton's back at it with the drama, big time. He's laying out his feelings for Kayla like he's gunning for an award, even though they might not be related by blood. It's like he's the main character in a tearjerker, making us all reach for the tissues. The suspense is building up to a twist that's going to smack us in the feels. And just when you think it can't get more intense, brace yourself, there's more to come. I've gone through a lot the last 20 years, Your Honor. This is my life, Your Honor. I I've made some, some bad choices, Your Honor, but I've never run from any of my children, Your Honor. And that's why I'm, I'm here today right here in court because I felt all the hurt, everything, Your I Honor. see your heart is breaking, I really do. And just when you think you've got it all figured out, plot twist. In the case of Brown v. Hampton, pertaining to 20-year-old Kayla Brown, Mr. Hampton, you have desperately waited for this answer. You are not her father. Can you believe the turn of events? Phelan Hannon reveals on her mother's deathbed. She was told that David Dorsey, a man she has never met, is her biological father. She comes to court to prove paternity and seek closure, marking her first ever encounter with Dorsey. Phelan couldn't help but wonder if this mystery dad came with a handbook on how to deal with dramatic revelations 101, or at least a sorry I missed your life greeting card. Just when you think it can't get more dramatic, keep watching. Hannon, you grew up believing one man was your father until the age of 13 when he said, I am not your daddy. Your mother then told you on her deathbed that another man, the defendant David Dorsey, is your biological father. You are here to prove paternity and gain closure. And you have never spoken to or laid eyes on Mr. Dorsey, but will meet him for the very first time. So you're all set for the big daddy-daughter dance, dreaming of that perfect fatherly figure to twirl you around when suddenly, bam, the man you've been calling dad hits you with a sorry kiddo, not your actual dad. It's like gearing up to meet Santa Claus, only to catch your Uncle Rick in the red suit sneaking cookies at midnight. Talk about a plot twist. You don't know her. No, I don't. Miss Hannon, do you have a picture of your mother with you? Show that picture to Mr. Dorsey. Do you remember that woman? No, ma'am. Oh. Miss Hannon, what have you been told about your mother's relationship with Mr. Dorsey? Um, from our conversations that we used to have, it was like they talked, like they weren't in a relationship, I guess, like they talked here and there. I knew that he worked at a fast food restaurant. He was a manager at a fast food restaurant from her and, you know, talked, mingled here and there. Were you a manager at a fast food restaurant? No, ma'am, but I worked at a fast food restaurant. You worked at one? Yes, ma'am. In the latest Who's Your Daddy roller coaster episode, we've hit a twist that's soap opera worthy. Mr. Hampton isn't Kayla's biological dad after all. It's like we're dealing with the world's most stubborn Christmas lights. Just when you think you've untangled everything, another knot appears. As we pick our jaws up from the ground, it's clear this family saga has more surprises in store. Keep your eyes peeled because this ride's loop-de-loop -loop has more twists coming. Just when we thought we'd seen it all, the story peels back another layer, gearing up to wow us again. Strap in because this tale is about to throw another wild pitch, adding even more spice to an already zesty story. As you listen to Mr. Dorsey consistently say, I don't even know this one. I've never even met her. Or in your heart, you do believe that is your father and this is your sister. It makes me feel torn because he says he doesn't remember. But who all remembers every white night stand I didn't have when they was a kid? So I can't fault him for saying he don't remember? Maybe he don't remember that fling. He just wasn't doesn't the remember best that. I'm, I, I 
don't remember having sex with your mom. I'm sorry. That's fine. <laughs> what was it that made you want to come today? I mean, if you've never met this woman and you have never had sex with her and you don't know what is going on, why did you come? I want closure for violence. Just when you thought daytime TV had maxed out on drama, the courtroom takes it up a notch. The judge, with a flair for the theatrical, leans forward, about to drop the kind of bombshell that makes soap operas look like documentaries. Mr. Dorsey, you are not the father. <laughs> Ms. Baker, the plaintiff, opens her case by stating the outcome of her marriage depends on the DNA results of her three-month-old son, Caleb, whom she insists was fathered by her husband, Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker counters with a medical impossibility claim due to a vasectomy he had 30 years prior, adding that if the results prove Caleb isn't his, he will leave. The tension in their marriage is palpable, underscored by the gravity of the DNA results on their future together. You won't believe what's coming up next? Ms. Baker, you say the fate of your marriage is riding on today's DNA results. You are suing to prove that your three-month-old son, Caleb, was fathered by your husband, Mr. Baker. Your and Mr. Baker, you say it's medically impossible for you to have a child, and therefore, Caleb cannot be yours. Ms. Baker, you say the relationship truly is on the rocks. At the time I got pregnant, I um, was drinking quite a bit. This next part is a real twist. Mr. Baker details his vasectomy, conducted back in 1991, and emphasizes his belief in its effectiveness by mentioning the improbability of fathering a child post vasectomy based on his research, he recounts his shock upon learning of Ms. Baker's pregnancy, initially doubting the pregnancy test's accuracy and fearing for his wife's health due to possible cancer. This moment underscores Mr. Baker's skepticism and the initial turmoil the unexpected pregnancy caused, highlighting the deep-seated doubts and fears he harbors regarding the paternity of Caleb. Just when you think you've heard it all, wait for what's next. And I don't condone the actions that we took in our relationship. I was married, she was married. You have two people who are in a monogamous relationship come together the way that we did, there's always going to cast doubt on the back of your mind. How do I know she wouldn't do this to me? We did it to each other. And when we did that, we hurt a lot of people. 12 children today, but 11 children were deeply hurt because of the actions that we made. Hold on, it gets even more intriguing. At 45, Ms. Baker's pregnancy is portrayed as nearly miraculous, especially given Mr. Baker's vasectomy and the couple's prior consideration of vasectomy reversal to have a child together. The narrative shifts to a blend of hope and disbelief, illustrating how the pregnancy rekindled their regret of not sharing a biological child. This twist adds a layer of emotional complexity to the story, mixing regret, hope, and the fear of the unknown. But the story takes an even more surprising turn soon. Had instances in your previous marriage... Yes, I do. ...that you said were revealed on the national stage, the limelight? Well, I know that she had went on a very public show. Which show did you go on? The Oprah Winfrey Show. And I wanted you to confirm that because I actually do remember that episode. I remember your husband thought you were a certain amount of money in debt. You were lying and it was, the number was like tens of thousands. Of thousands. Exactly. Yes. Just when you think you've figured it out, Dr. Jamila Gator provides expert testimony on the possibility of fathering a child post vasectomy, noting that while Mr. Baker's chances were slim, they were not zero. Her input shifts the narrative towards a scientific perspective, offering a glimmer of hope to Ms. Baker's claims and introducing a pivotal point in the case. This expert analysis bridges the gap between medical facts and the couple's personal ordeal, setting the stage for the resolution of their paternity dispute. You'll be on the edge of your seat with what comes next. You say that it's medically impossible for you to have fathered this child. Yes, Your Honor. Explain. Back in 1991, when my ex was pregnant with our fourth child, while she was pregnant, I had a vasectomy. And so, based upon the research that I have done regarding vasectomy, me. Once the procedure hits the 20-year mark, they literally put it into the realm of impossibility. This revelation is heart-stopping. The climactic reveal of the DNA results confirms. It has been determined by this court, Mr. Baker, you are the father. <laughs> <laughs> Dark versus Bailey. Mr. Dark throws a curveball, accusing Ms. Bailey of playing the field and casting major doubt on the paternity of her nearly a year old son, swearing on his collection of rare sneakers that there's no way he's the dad. Ms. Bailey fires back, insisting Mr. Dark is the one and only father and goes further, labeling him as the king of deadbeats. Strap in, folks, because this drama train is just leaving the station and it's about to pick up some serious speed. Mr. Dark, you say the defendant is a promiscuous liar who broke your heart four years ago, stepping out on 
your then relationship. You admit to having a one night stand with her two years ago, but are furious. Ms. Bailey is now claiming you fathered her 11 month old son, which you say is impossible. Better grab your popcorn because the plot is about to twist and shout. Mr. Dark dives into the epic, slightly hilarious backstory of their love hate relationship, starting from the fateful swipe right, their wild dreams of a sitcom worthy family life, and a dubious incident at a karaoke night that sparked his suspicions of Ms. Bailey's fidelity. These suspicions got a giant, neon lit confirmation sign when Ms. Bailey's so called friend spilled the beans, leading to their dramatic first act breakup. As we peel back the layers of this onion of a relationship, make sure you have tissues handy. For the tears of laughter or sorrow, we can't yet tell. I've been knowing Ms. Bailey for probably about seven or eight years, and she's had a history of things like this. I'm just gonna uh, tell you a little bit about myself and Ms. Bailey. Um, we was in a relationship for about four years. Everything was okay, everything was pretty good. When I first met her, we had some good conversations about establishing us a family and probably having kids. She, we lived together at that time. I left to go out of town to do some work. I was working out of town, out of state, as a matter of fact. I went to Florida to do some work in Florida. But wait, there's a plot twist you didn't see coming. Despite their stormy split, Mr. Dark and Ms. Bailey found themselves in a It's Complicated sequel, leading to the unexpected plot twist of their child's conception. Mr. Dark, ever the skeptic, raises an eyebrow or two at Ms. Bailey's timeline of events, suggesting a paternity plot twist worthy of a daytime TV award. Brace yourselves because we're diving into a cloud of doubt thicker than fog on a San Francisco morning. I thought you were cheating on me. Okay. But... So you admit you cheated on him? I did. And so your best friend told on you? Yeah. What happened to your relationship with Miss Bailey at that point? I, I tried to work past it, again, because of the things that we had already discussed, of us being a family and us trying to work things out, possibly us getting married or whatever the case may be, but I tried to work it past for about uh, approximately a year or so, but I just couldn't take it. I couldn't. I couldn't deal with it no more. Now, we delve into the disputed timeline of the pregnancy, with Mr. Dark doing some math that doesn't add up, hinting that the stork might have visited the wrong address due to the curious timing of their last tango and the baby's grand entrance. The plot thickens to the consistency of Grandma's gravy, and we're here for it. And then that means the conception window would be February 17th, February 24th, 2016. Mm -hmm. And you said you had... all weren't intimate until March. Yes, ma'am. Right. And she had I had early. him early, like, I was due November 30th. Oh, what a 30th, okay. Yeah. So what you're saying, Mr. Dark, is this doesn't add up. No, ma'am, no kind of way. At the hospital, Ms. Bailey launches a full court press on Mr. Dark to sign the birth certificate, weaving in a spider's web of legal and emotional guilt, despite his ongoing paternity concert. I was there when he was born. The onesies and stuff that he took home, okay, so I bought for them. Okay, so why did you sign the birth the pampers, certificate? The... What are you feeling in this moment? Like, What's I don't... upsetting you? And the reason why I signed the birth certificate to answer your question is because you told me at the hospital that if I didn't sign it right then, then I no, wouldn't I have another not, opportunity I didn't, to sign it. No, I didn't. You didn't have to sign it. I didn't force you to sign it. You if signed I it on your own. If I didn't sign it, what you what was gonna happen? He won't have your last name, you won't get to sign it. Did you not say that? Okay, but... Okay. Ms. Bradley, Mr. Dark's latest flame, throws shade on the baby's family resemblance and brings her own bun in the oven into the timeline debate as Exhibit B. Gear up for a narrative somersault that'll make your head spin. Do you know who your child's biological father is? That yeah. child, you do know? Yes, I do. So now, history is repeating itself in this moment for you. Yes, it is. If you want more episodes of Paternity Court, question then is were you intimate in February during the window of conception we outlined February 17th to February 24th. No, ma'am. No. Both of you said no. Mm -hmm. Just when you thought we'd hit peak drama, the plot explodes. The air gets thick with accusations, past skeletons dance out of the closet, and both Mr. Dark and Ms. Bailey launch into a verbal fireworks display over fidelity, intentions, and who's the real MVP of messiness. We're reaching a fever pitch of confrontation, but the grand finale is still on the horizon. What would you like to tell the court? Well, first, my, in my personal opinion, I don't feel like the baby looks like. That's just, just my personal opinion. So you do not feel like there is a physical resemblance? No. What else do you know about the paternity well, situation? Well, my due date is November 19th. My conception date is February 24th. Cue the dramatic music for the moment of truth. The DNA results sweep in like a season finale twist. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Dark, you are the father. <laughs> 
strap in, folks, because you're not gonna believe the roller coaster ride we're about to embark on. The gavel hits, and the legendary Judge Lake sets the stage for the showdown of the century, Hall v. Richards. In one corner, we have Ms. Hall, flanked by her no-nonsense mother, throwing the book at Mr. Richards for ducking out on daddy duties to little Damani, who's barely had time to see the world. And in the other, Mr. Richards, armed with a not-my-circus, not-my-monkey defense, claims Ms. Hall is just trying to snag him with a baby trap. Buckle up, Buttercup, it's gonna be a wild ride. Ms. Hall, you and your mother are furious with the defendant because he denies your one-month-old son, Damani, and does nothing to support him. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Richards, you believe that Ms. Hall is claiming you are the father because she wants to be with you. Uh, you say Ms. Hall was thirsty for love and she needs to go oh. find her child's real dad. Grab your popcorn, because the circus is in town. Ms. Hall takes the stand, pouring her heart out about Mr. Richards' ghosting act on their son. But wait, Mr. Richards fires back, essentially calling Ms. Hall a love-starved, baby-crazy woman on a mission to anchor him down with fatherhood. The crowd's gasps and snickers underscore the melodrama, setting the stage for an epic soap opera twist. You think you've seen it all, but folks, we're just getting started. You haven't done anything for the child at all, no, admittedly. No, ma'am. And that's because you sincerely doubt paternity? Yes. What's the nature of this relationship? Tell me, what, what's, what was going on here? The baby's just one month old and everything fell apart already? What, what is going on? A couple years back, he broke my heart and I decided to give him another chance. You all were boyfriend and girlfriend a couple years ago or you were just dating? We're yeah. dating. The plot thickens as we dive deep into the tempestuous ocean that is Miss Hall and Mr. Richard's past. Picture it, a whirlwind of breakups, makeups, and late night you up texts leading to this very paternity drama. The term thirsty gets thrown around more than a football at a tailgate, unveiling a tangled web of seduction, rejection, and deception. The story's getting juicier, and trust me, you'll want to stick around for the plot twists. It wasn't just like I broke her heart in 2013. We had an issue. It was like broke both of our heart, I guess you could say that. This time, I felt like maybe I was wrong for the way I ended things last time, so I gave her and another chance. So how did you reach out to her? Instagram DM, told her, hey, she replied. So how is she thirsty if he hit her up? Thirst is going both ways, ma'am. But I would he called admit, her thirsty, though. <laughs> I would admit How's I was being thirsty ways, also. Thirsty. Things get real as we zero in on the conception conundrum. A timeline tighter than skinny jeans suggests Mr. Richards might be the dad, but whispers of betrayal and double-dealing cloud the waters. As we navigate this maze of maybe babies and could-be cuckolds, brace yourself for a bombshell revelation that'll make your jaw drop. Because you just wanted to what? Date her again? Because you said to me you did it because you thought the last time it didn't really end right. Yeah, that was probably something I told her that she wanted to hear, Your Honor. No, you told me that. So don't tell me what I you mean, think she want to hear. Did you reach back out to her because you felt like you wanted to rekindle the relationship? Or did you reach back out to her because you just wanted to be involved with her for the time being? For the time being, Your Honor. Feel the tension as Ms. Hall recounts the emotional roller coaster of her pregnancy and the nerve-wracking moment she tells Mr. Richards. His skepticism is as thick as molasses, adding fuel to the fiery drama between them. But don't change the channel. The next episode in this saga promises more twists, turns, and jaw-dropping moments. It was like a fling. They stopped talking and then he came to spend time with her for her birthday and stayed a week. Then when he left, it was, oh, I don't want you no more and talking crap again. So you went to stay with her for a week, Mr. Richards, and then after that, you basically broke up with her again? No, At Your Honor, I think I was there for no longer than four days. I had a reason for breaking up with her. The day I was leaving, I go to the bus. It was about 9, 10 o'clock. I found out the bus didn't come to where I was going until 3 o'clock that afternoon. Both parties dig in their heels as the stakes skyrocket, lobbing accusations like grenades across the courtroom. Mr. Richards plays the infidelity card, while Ms. Hall stands her ground, swearing by her loyalty. The drama hits fever pitch, setting the stage for an explosive revelation that'll have you on the edge of your seat. So when I go outside to get the water, I look across the street, it's the same dude I see coming out the gate. So I'm like, whoa, I didn't say anything, and I probably spent the rest of that day on the couch till the bus came. Officially on the bus, I sent the message, like, I seen the messages in your phone, but I seen the guy across the street, and that's where it ended. I told her to block my number. Had you all made some type of commitment to one another, what would give you the right to take her phone, look in it, and then be angry if somebody was texting her? She's paying her own bills. The air crackles with anticipation as the DNA results are unveiled. Been determined by this court. Mr. Richards, you are the father. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so, white versus white, no pun intended. In a bold move to rescue her teetering marriage, Mrs. White decides to drop the bombshell about her colorful past and the paternity of her darling three-year-old Savannah. Just when you think it's going to be a straightforward case, buckle up. This ride's about to get wild. Ms. White, you've opened your case because your last and only way to save your marriage and family is to prove to your husband that he fathered your three-year-old daughter, Savannah. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. You admit you've cheated. Picture the scene, the air thick with suspense. Mr. White's throwing side eyes, questioning if he's really Savannah's dad after Mrs. White's not-so-little oopsie of infidelity. He's on the brink of calling it quits if the DNA test doesn't say daddy. But folks, grab your popcorn because the drama train is leaving the station. Really, Mr. White, a divorce? Yes, ma'am. Explain. I, I just can't be with somebody that's gonna constantly cheat on me and have me raise somebody else's child. Savannah has the right to know and I have the right to know. And you love this little girl. Yes, I love her to death. Just when you thought it couldn't get any spicier, turns out Mrs. White has been playing away from home, not once, not twice, but multiple times since they said, I do. The stakes for the paternity test are sky high, folks. Strap in, this roller coaster's got loops. And now you just don't have any trust in this relationship. No, because from a week after we got married until February of this year, I've been catching her cheating constantly. A week after you got married? Yes, Your Honor. In a plot twist that has us reeling, Mrs. White spills the beans on her extracurricular activities, blaming a cocktail of feeling unloved and abandoned. She's pinning all her hopes on this paternity test to stitch her marriage back together. Spoiler alert, the drama llama has just entered the chat. Yes, our anniversary is in two days. And and so I'm, I want to make this right so we can better our marriage and just prove that Savannah is his. You are certain Savannah is your husband's biological child? Yes, Your Honor. Tell me about when you got married. Take me back to that time. I moved in with them after a month of being together. Probably eight months later, I ended up getting pregnant with our first child. Just when you think you've seen it all, the Whites take us on a flashback to their whirlwind romance and quickie wedding, with Mrs. White owning up to her wanderings but holding on to hope for a fairy tale ending. Folks, don't touch that dial. There's more juice gossip ahead. We ended up splitting up and I was over at my mom's house and he said the only way I could come back into the house is if I was to admit everything and be honest. And he let you back home after that? Yes, Your Honor. Take me to that day. I can't imagine this happening. I was hurt and I was pissed off, but and at the same time, it was kind of a relief because I knew for a fact that it was actually happening. It wasn't just, oh, it's an assumption. I don't know for a fact. Just when you're ready to throw in the towel on love, bam. Texts and receipts of Mrs. White's adventures in cheating Lynn's surface, shaking the very foundations of trust and marriage stability. But wait, there's more heartbreak on the horizon. Separate parents, but we still sit there and have a civil relationship for the kids. Do you have any other reason to believe that your wife cheated other times? Uh, I have text messages proof right here of the most recent is Valentine's Day. She went to another man's house while I'm sitting at the house with the kids. Well, that's because you didn't even get me anything, and you were just yelling at me. You, you were treating me like crap and was gonna go to a friend's house. Brace yourselves for a scandalous revelation that'll make your jaw hit the floor. More damning evidence of Mrs. White's indiscretions floods in, including some NSFW Valentine's Day surprises. But folks, the real showstopper is yet to grace the stage. Your wife says, LMAO, could you do that for me? Miss White, why are you so quiet? Why, why are you texting your ex-boyfriend these things? Because he don't treat me right. Like Your body is naked wishing you were in the bed. Which bed? Your husband's bed? Yeah. Mr. White, you submitted another text message? Oh, this is another guy. This is not the ex-boyfriend's name. Oh. Get ready for the tearjerker moment as Mrs. White makes a heartfelt plea for her marriage, shedding light on the tangled web of emotions, the undeniable bond with their children, and her vow to turn over a new leaf. The finale is looming, but it's not all rainbows and butterflies. Miss White, why are you entertaining all these men on text? Because he doesn't show me anything. Always with the He's pivot. not there for Always me. Always pivoting, you're trying to put it off on me. How you expect me to treat you the way you want to be treated when you're sitting here sexting other people and doing all this other stuff, somebody something they want when I'm getting treated like I'm just a piece of crap. In a finale that'll have you on the edge of your seat, the envelope with the paternity results is opened, and lo and behold. It has been determined by this court. Mr. White, you are her father. 
the courtroom brims with suspense as Jerome rolls out the dramatic intro. This is the case of Brown versus Stewart. Jerome, the court officer, cues up the stage for a high-stakes paternity and custody battle involving Mr. Brown and Miss Stewart. You won't believe the twists and turns this case takes. Hello, Your Honor. Hello. This is a case of Brown versus Stewart. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Mr. Brown, just two and a half months ago, it was revealed that your 18-month-old son, Colby, may not be your biological child, even though you currently have full custody. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Brown steps up, already looking like he's been through the emotional ringer. Mr. Brown, just two and a half months ago, it was revealed that your 18-month-old son, Colby, may not be your biological child, despite you having full custody. Oh, man, you can almost hear the collective gasp from the crowd. Grab your popcorn. This is getting good. To prove that you are Colby's father because you fear if you are not, you will lose him for good. Miss Stewart, you admit you kept the secret from Mr. Brown, but claim the truth is the truth. And the fact is, you were secretly cheating on him, and you appear in court today to prove that the other man is the father. So, Mr. Brown, tell us what's at stake for you today. Things get even spicier as Miss Stewart stands her ground. She's 100% sure Mr. Brown isn't the father, talking big about her efforts to provide for Colby. I've been working my butt off every day. Hold on to your hats. Mr. Brown is about to throw a curveball. My house is a more stable home for him. It's a place where he's taken care of, and I know it's the better thing for him. So, Miss Stewart, you're saying that you know for certain that he's not Mr. And Brown's biological child. I'm 100% sure he's not the father. And you understand what's at stake, though. You understand that Mr. Brown is saying he has a healthy, happy upbringing in his I home. know he's with me and when he's gonna be happy and healthy. Mr. Brown lays out his version of the breakup drama, painting a picture of custody chaos. Well, because after she moved out, she asked me if I wanted him for a couple of days while she was moving her things out. And then, bam, he drops the bomb that he decided not to give Colby back. The audience is on the edge of their seats. What will happen next? How did you even find this out? Well, because after she moved out, asked me if I wanted him for a couple days, and I told her that I wasn't going to give him back at that point in time because I knew what my rights were. I knew that the living situations at my household, she was at. I mean, I've got a five-bedroom home where he's got his own playroom, he's got his own bedroom. When did she say to you, but this is not your child? Right then and there. But she waited almost five days before she brought the cops to my house. Enter Miss Tesk, Mr. Brown's girlfriend, adding her two cents and stirring the pot. She's emotionally and financially invested in this whole mess, claiming he's the best father in the world to that little boy. Drama, drama, drama. Don't you just love it? You first got the news from her and she dropped this bomb on you. Did you say, I want a DNA Test. Sure, Honor. I called uh, DHS and talked to them, and they informed me that I needed to call Child Support Recovery, because that's who does the DNA test in the state that we live in. When I went down and filled out the paperwork, once they started running it, they informed me that I couldn't do the DNA test because Miss Stewart had already filed child support on me. Miss Stewart denies ever asking for child support, deepening the mystery. No, Your Honor, she insists, baffling everyone about why the state might want Mr. Brown to pay up. Just when you think you've figured it out, the story twists again. Did you go down and file paperwork or sign anything no, requesting Your Honor. child support? No, Your Honor, because I went down myself to see if I can get this DNA started. We couldn't do nothing because he has signed the paternity affidavit. As you were going through the process, did you tell any government agency, this is the father, the father is Mr. Brown? No. The moment of truth arrives as Judge Lake reads the DNA test results. Mr. Brown, you are not the father. Oh I told you. I told you. Sorry. Right. As the courtroom brims with anticipation, Jerome steps up with a clear voice to set the stage. The case of Brooks versus Page is announced. The bailiff, Jerome, with his usual flair, introduces the case to the judge in the courtroom, making everyone lean in just a bit closer, ready for the drama that's about to unfold. You won't believe what's coming next. Hello, Your Honor. Hello. This is the case of Brooks versus Page. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Ms. Brooks, you state that after getting out of a nine-year relationship, you met and fell in love with Mr. Page, a younger man who you say swept you off your feet. You claim both you and Mr. Page plan to have a child together, but since giving birth to your son, Ivion, Mr. Page throws a curveball with his paternity doubts, spicing up the courtroom drama. Mr. Page expresses his doubts about being Ivon's father, accusing Ms. Brooks of having an affair with another man, Tony Wilson, whom he believes could be the father. He mentions social media posts that complicate his suspicions. Buckle up, because the evidence about to be revealed is as juicy as it gets. Mr. Page, you state you know the child isn't yours, 
because Ms. Brooks was having an ongoing affair with another man by the name of Tony Wilson. Yes. You say Mr. Wilson, who is also here today, claims to be the father of her son and has even posted pictures on social media to that effect. So, Ms. Brooks, describe the nature of your relationship with the defendant. Right now, our relationship is on the rocks. We really have no relationship. With everyone on the edge of their seats, the evidence is finally brought forward. Evidence is presented in court. Photos from Mr. Wilson's social media profile are shown, depicting him and Ms. Brooks in close proximity, which Mr. Page argues indicates more than just friendship. Get ready for the reaction shots. This courtroom is about to turn into a real-life soap opera. That is just my friend. We take tell me if that looks. Please tell me if that looks that. like a relationship or a friendship. There is no space in between it's the bodies, Your Honor. They right up. If they wanted to turn around and kiss, they could kiss. We are just that close. Like so, that's how this close we is are. a picture of Mr. Wilson. This is his profile picture, and that's you. Ms. Yes. Brooks and Mr. Wilson? Yes, that's me and Mr. Wilson. Picture is just a picture, like... It's As Mr. Wilson makes his entrance, the room's tension is palpable. The judge invites Mr. Wilson to the courtroom to give his testimony. Mr. Wilson describes his relationship with Ms. Brooks as purely platonic and insists he views Ivan as his godson, not his son. The twists keep coming, and what he says next might just tilt the scales. You're so not have an father. argument. Every time we argue, she tells me I'm not the father. That's this is more one, father, two, Your three Honor. times. We live in the same... Office often have to tell young women this, and everybody's had an argument where they said something they regret or they shouldn't say or say something to hurt someone or just trying to make someone hurt as much as they've they made them hurt. But when we say things like that, you can't unring that bell. Once you ring it, is wrong. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Wilson's revelation sends whispers around the room. Mr. Wilson admits to falsely claiming he was Ivan's father to make another woman jealous, revealing the complex interpersonal dynamics and the impact of social media rumors on the case. This bombshell will have you asking, what will they think of next? He's laying there about to go to Is sleep. Is that where you, you try to complete it the next level, get to the next level to play on your video games? That's when you do all this? Are you serious right now? A single parent in the home with somebody, every time I ask him to do anything for his Avion, and at the end of the day, I don't, my son doesn't have another side of the fence. Have you told people, Mr. Wilson, that you're Ivy Ons? Your Honor, yes. yes. See, what happened was, it was this girl I was dealing with because she had an issue with Miss Brooks because her hair was long, fingernails, she has on press-ons. I was just making her be jealous. As the DNA results are about to be revealed, everyone holds their breath. The DNA test results are revealed. Mr. Wilson, you are not the father. Told. Mm. Told. Mr. Page, you are the father. Told you, told you. Since that I had to go through all of this just to prove that all of this. It no sense that you with somebody who keep lying on you. You keep don't make no sense. Kicking things off with a bang, Ms. Haysbert steps up to the plate, suing Mr. Howard for a paternity test for their bouncing baby boy, Ricardo Jr. She's all about getting some financial support, which she says has been non-existent. The judge tunes in, ready to unravel this messy yarn. Things are just heating up, folks. Ms. Haysbert, you are suing the father of your six-month-old son for a paternity test. You yes. claim the defendant, Mr. Howard, has never financially supported baby Ricardo Jr. You also state that he once led you to believe that he wanted to marry you and even asked you to have his baby. Hold on to your hats. Ms. Haysbert drops a bombshell that Mr. Howard has another child, just two weeks older than Ricardo Jr. The courtroom buzzes with whispers and gasps as she spills the beans on Mr. Howard's ghosting act once she was pregnant. Buckle up, this roller coaster is just getting started. You say he abandoned you and has since fathered another baby who mm -hmm. is only two weeks older than your child. Yes, Sean. Mr. Howard, you argue that Ms. Haysbert told you that Ricardo Jr. was not your son and therefore is not your responsibility. You are countersuing for $1,000 in damages. You won't believe this backstory. From office buddies to more than friends, Ms. Haysbert outlines their evolution amidst laughter from the audience. The judge steps in, urging civility as she recounts their slide from professional to personal. Mr. Howard's side of the story is up next, and you bet it's juicy. I met this clown at the Washington Redskins <laughs> Stadium. Hold on one second. Let's use respectful language. We were co-workers and then after that we became friends. It was to the point like when something was wrong, he came to me. We started having sex and we got what? drunk. So yeah, we got drunk and had sex and that's how I see my son. Got drunk and had sex. After that, like I knew he had a girlfriend and you know, I didn't mind because we were just friends. Then it came to the point where he told me when she was pregnant and she had a miscarriage. Just when you thought it couldn't get crazier, Mr. Howard admits to his double daddy duties but pleads a sort of adorable cluelessness about how it all happened.
happen. The crowd can't help but react to this sitcom-worthy confession. And yes, the plot thickens even more from here. Did you get two girls pregnant at the same time? Yes, I did, Your Honor. But I didn't mean to. I, I completely didn't mean say, to. But at the same time, she did you call me a clown. To. I won't respect your court. But she looking like one. Like, but for she, real. But she, Let's be respectful. I am being respectful. Because but she, the, she can't you not, that's what you <laughs> are making commentary about is yourself because you exactly. just admitted that you slept with her. So it was obviously mm. something about you wanted this. Like, so. Tensions hit a new high as Ms. Haysbert confronts Mr. Howard with alleged lovey-dovey texts that contradict his courtroom demeanor. She's not just throwing shade, she's throwing the whole tree. Watch as they dive into the nitty-gritty of love, lies, and baby supplies. Next up, the drama around a family heirloom takes center stage. After he says that he would step up to the plate, you're saying he actually denied your son. He did. He want to play around since he want to act like he my dad. Tell him some, let's go get Dana. Let's go to the clinic to see who the baby is. He told me he loved me. He don't want to lose me. You hand me that. So, that he loved me. You so say till death do us part when he gave me that ring. Uh-uh, I didn't give you nothing. You stole you it. Said, you stole, stole it. You stole it. You was a liar. You was a liar up in this courtroom. Whatever, that's all you're doing is lying. The saga takes a turn into soap opera territory with the tale of the contested ring. Ms. Haysbert argues it was a symbol of Mr. Howard's commitment. While he claims it was Nick, they squabble over this sentimental piece like it's the last slice of pizza at a party. The DNA results are on deck, and you won't want to miss it. Mr. Um, she Howard, got a out. the ring that you are countersuing for the value of $1,000, yes. your grandmother's ring, you say Ms. Haysbert pawned but you just why the smirk? Because I did. She, that's what I deal with. She what was your understanding? Was it your understanding that the ring was yours? It said he wanted Ain't to marry me. Nothing. So you therefore, me. therefore, give you nothing. I pawned it. It was in my wife's give you pawned nothing. it. Drum roll, please. The DNA test results are in. Mr. Howard, you are his father. Death do us pop, boo. All right, I'm gonna so be a man. So it is what it is. I'm gonna be a Don't man. Call my you learned your lesson, am I oh, correct? I did, yeah. And you need to learn yours. Quit running around with your grandmother's ring talking about who you love and who you don't love. Decide as a man who you love, commit to that woman, and develop a real relationship. Better from all three of you. Are we clear? The courtroom is charged with anticipation as Jerome, the court coordinator, calls the case to order. This sets the stage for a dramatic family and paternity dispute involving Frankie Lons, her daughter Elite Noel, and the potential fathers, Mr. Randolph and Mr. Robertson. The room is buzzing and everyone's ready for the drama to unfold in the case of Lons versus Randolph Robertson. Hello, Your Honor. Hello. This is the case of Lons versus Randolph Robertson. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Ms. Lons, you claim that while filming your popular reality TV show, a DNA test determined that the man you believe was your daughter Elite's father was not. Judge Lake kicks things off with a warm but serious greeting. She quickly gets down to business, outlining the sticky situation that unfolded on national television Frankie Lons amid filming her popular reality show, found out through a DNA test that the man she thought was her daughter Elite's father was, in fact, not. The plot thickens as suspicions about Mr. Randolph, Elite's uncle, come to light. Grab your popcorn, because this is just the beginning. Mr. Randolph may be her biological father. Ms. Noel, you stay. It was devastating to find out that the man you believed was your dad dad was not, and you now believe that his brother is your father. Mr. Randolph, you claim that even though both you and your brother had a sexual relationship with Ms. Lon, you do not believe you are her biological father either. That's correct, Your Honor. Frankie Lons takes the stand, ready to bear her soul. She talks about her past, marked by struggles and recovery, and her commitment to finding the truth for the sake of her daughter's peace of mind. Her testimony is a mix of confession and determination, painting a picture of a woman who's been through the ringer, but hasn't lost her spirit. Just when you think you've heard it all, Frankie adds another layer to her story. Why is it so important to resolve these issues today? Well, this happened like 30 years ago, and you know my past has always haunted me no matter what. I'm a recovering drug addict and a lot of more other things. I don't hang on the streets, and I don't run amok with the gang members, have not been back to jail. I learned a lot from it. I could be dead for the things I used to do. I'm not gonna quit and tell my daughter and me put closer on who her father is. Elite Noel shares her emotional turmoil, opening up about how the revelation shook her world and strained her relationship with her mother. Her account is heartfelt and raw, revealing the deep scars left by family secrets and the weight of societal judgment. As she speaks, you can hear a pin drop in the courtroom. Everyone is hanging on her every word. And guess what? There's more drama around the corner. How that affected you? I mean, I felt as if I should have never had tried 
to even take that step. I closed up with my mom. I also closed up with Vic, which is the guy that originally we, you know, tested. And I, and I'm not gonna lie, I, it, it's a, a bitter thing for me. I used to hide this story. You know what I mean? I didn't want anybody to. Like I said, I didn't want to judge my mom, but I didn't want to be judged for it. A curveball comes flying in when Mr. Randolph expresses shock about the paternity doubts aired on the reality show. He claims he was out of the loop, sparking a flurry of whispers and side eyes in the courtroom. This revelation spins the case into new territory, with miscommunications and missed connections adding to the confusion. Keep watching, because this tangle is about to get even naughtier. And that you could. No. You never were made aware of that. No. Until some people called me from around the country and said, Frankie said on national television it's that their uncle could be her father. At that point, did you reach out to Ms. Lons? Did you reach out to Ms. Noel? Well, you, I I didn't, he's why didn't you contact father. me? Hold on, let's talk one I at a time. I tried to reach Frankie, I didn't but was reached. unsuccessful in doing so. So you did try to reach out to Ms. Yes. Lons? Elite dives into the story of her 18th birthday revelation, a day that brought more surprises than she bargained for. The man listed as her father on the birth certificate outright denied paternity, claiming a strict boys-only policy in his gene pool. Frankie, in her typical no-filter style, explains the mix-up with a hint of sarcasm and a shrug. The courtroom is on the edge of its seats as the layers of this family drama continue to unfold. Did you ever see your birth certificate? Were you able to look at it and see who that person was? Well, yeah, about 18 years old, my adopted mother felt that I was old enough. David Noel was the guy on my birth certificate. I had an address on him. I knocked on the door and I gave him the story and he told me, absolutely not. I only reproduce boys. I have five boys and I don't have that girls. Mr. Randolph takes a trip down memory lane, reminiscing about the wild days with his dance group and their popularity that attracted a slew of groupies, including Ms. Lons. His candid recount of their boogalooing and robotting days adds a lighter note to the proceedings, though the implications are anything but light. Fasten your seatbelts, because we're diving deeper into this soap opera. I'm part of a dance group called the Black Resurgence, internationally known for boogaloo and robot and strut. Her sister, one of the members of our group, her other sister, another member of the group, her and my brother and their friend and I became, were involved in a relationship. But we had that situation, the group of us, with various sets of girls around the neighborhood. Oh, say groupies. As if this party needed more guests, Judge Lake calls in another potential father, Mr. Robertson, turning the courtroom into a full-blown reunion. The stakes are high, and the tension is thicker than a bowl of oatmeal, as another chapter in this paternity mystery is about to be read aloud. You won't want to miss what he has to say. <laughs> Have you ever heard about Mr. Robertson <laughs> as a potential? Never. Ms. Lyons has stood here and basically admitted her mistake. Never. This is what I've done. This is what I was doing. You have also said we were very sexually active. I don't understand how little people keep appearing and you don't ever say to yourself, this child be mine? God bless your know. heart, darling. I wish nothing but the best for you. The moment of truth arrives with the first DNA test result. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Randolph, you are not her father. Oh. I'm very sorry, Miss Noel. So, here we go. Amber Thayer, in a bold move, has dragged her hubby, Mr. Thayer, into paternity court. It's not just a casual date. She's here to confirm he's the real dad to not one, but two munchkins, 19-month-old Cadence and three-year-old Matthew Jr. It's kind of her last-ditch effort to glue what's left of their marriage back together, while also proving a major point about paternity. Talk about drama, right? Stay tuned, because this is just the warm-up. Miss Thayer, you are here today in hopes of saving what is left of your marriage. In doing so, you've summoned your husband, Mr. Thayer, to paternity court. Prove that not only did he father your 19-month-old daughter, Cadence, but also your three-year-old son, Matthew Jr. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Hold on to your seats. Judge Lake gets right to the point, asking Mr. Thayer if he's ready to pack up his marriage today, if the kids turn out not to be his. Spoiler alert, he totally is. He trusts his wife about as far as he can throw a piano, which isn't very far at all. This courtroom might just turn into a reality show stage. And guess what? The excitement is just starting. You say you absolutely do not trust your wife, and you are prepared to get a divorce today when the results reveal that either one or both are not yours. That's correct, Your Honor. So, Miss Thayer, what is the current status of your relationship with your husband? We don't even have sex anymore. What married couple doesn't have sex? Oops, they did it again. Amber talks about discovering she was pregnant with Matthew, despite their no babies plan, which apparently was more of a maybe baby plan, given their approach to contraception. Judge Lake can't help but point out the obvious. No protection, no surprise. The plot thickens as we dive deeper into the web of doubts Mr. Thayer has been weaving. Stick around. The revelations are 
were about to explode. I didn't know what to say because I wasn't planning on having any more kids. I mean, I had three girls already, so I was already a single mom. Were you all using girls. protection? No. Well, then you were not. planning on having another baby. That is correct. <laughs> And then I believe she so, was pregnant before we even got together because Matt, Matthew was born three weeks early. Cue the dramatic music. Mr. Thayer shares his side, feeling duped and dubious because Amber got pregnant at a time when their romantic rendezvous were as rare as a calm day in their house. His heart's on his sleeve, his fear's on display, and boy, does it make for compelling viewing. The DNA results are looming, and you won't want to miss what's next. When was Matthew born? May 18th. Oh, so there's your doubt. Yes, ma'am. And look, babies do come early. So, but you claim she was with somebody else approximately three weeks before. Yeah. See, you're, you feel emotional because it hurts. I mean, I love him or I wouldn't have married him. This is the person that I want to spend my life with. This is my first child too, Your Honor. I was excited. I didn't have no kids. I didn't have a family or anything and she was going to give that to me. Twist alert. Judge Lake drops a bombshell. They ran a lie detector test on Amber because why not add more suspense? This court isn't just about DNA. It's about truth, lies, and the occasional dramatic pause. The tension could be cut with a knife or maybe a gavel. Fasten your seatbelts. The results are about to make a big splash. Your doubt surrounding Cadence. That is your younger child. You all have two children together, potentially. Yeah, because at the time that, that she was conceived, uh, we weren't really having sex. Find out she's pregnant again and immediately doubt. Yes. How are we going to have a kid if we don't have sex? So you testified earlier, Ms. Thayer, that you were in a sexless marriage. Yes. I mean, when he's talking about with Cadence, I uprooted my whole life for him. Are you ready for this roller coaster to go off the rails? The lie detector test paints Amber as less than truthful, stirring up a storm of trust issues that makes hurricane paternity look like a gentle breeze. This key moment cranks up the drama to an 11, challenging everything we thought we knew about their situation. And believe it or not, there's still more to come. So we did, in fact, have her meet with a license polygraph expert. Let me have those lie detector results, yes, please. Judge. Ms. Thayer, you were asked, in the last four years, have you had sexual contact with anyone other than the two men you have previously disclosed? You said no. The lie detector determined you were being deceptive. Here it comes, the big finale. Mr. Thayer, you are the father. I told you. The tension is palpable as the court session begins. The case of Lee v. Lee kicks off with a classic family drama where the Lee siblings are at loggerheads, doubting whether their supposed brother, Patrick Lee, really shares the same father. The father in question is none other than Charles Lay Sr., a legendary football player known for his moves on the field and apparently some controversial plays off it. The judge rolls out the welcome mat and gets the show on the road, introducing the players in this familial feud. Just when you think it's straightforward, the complexities begin to unfold, hinting that we're in for quite the emotional roller coaster. Good morning. This is a case of Lee v. Lee. Thank you, Ron. Good day, everyone. Mr. Lee, you and your siblings claim the defendant was not fathered by your dad, Charles, a former professional football player and two-time Super Bowl champion who sadly passed away 10 years ago. The backstory hints at hidden family dynamics thick with plot twists. Patrick paints a Norman Rockwell picture of his childhood, claiming Charles Lee Sr. was a constant presence, a father figure from day one. However, whispers and doubts doubts about his paternity circulate due to his distinct lack of family resemblance. Imagine being the only apple in a basket of oranges. The dialogue raises more questions than a late night infomercial, questioning the very fabric of familial knowledge and recognition. Watch how the story takes a twist next, and trust me, it's juicier than a daytime soap opera. Did you know that was a football star, a Super Bowl champion? Did you know these things about his life? In the beginning, I didn't know. People would come up to me and tell me, you know, your father Excuse is... Excuse me, if you... Your father, wait a minute. If that's... If he had you all your life and you didn't know and you was hanging out with him. Oh, my father was the type of person he As I was saying, you Your Honor, before, about the story. If everybody knows, Everybody in Army know is. my father. So if you his son, you don't know, you, you didn't you... know at first? As the inheritance question looms, tensions rise like dough in a baker's kitchen. The siblings suggest Patrick's sudden urgency in proving his paternity might be linked to potential inheritance or other juicy family secrets simmering under the surface. Patrick whips out his birth certificate like a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat with Charles Lee, senior name proudly inked as the father. The siblings counter with a hefty dose of skepticism, stirring the pot and hinting at underlying family tensions that could give reality TV a run for its money. The atmosphere gets even more charged as we move forward. So grab your popcorn because the drama is just getting started. And let me see what I can get done. In your honor, now, I can say this. My father would bring home a stray dog <laughs> and raise the dog. <laughs> well, this is not a dog. Yeah. Uh, right. He's but what I'm saying, but this my, is what my, I'm trying to father. say to you. I get it's what you're saying. <laughs> 
Whether he knew definitively or not, this was his biological child. He basically would look at him as a young man in need. That was him. If it was a question then, why is my father's name on my birth certificate? Your father's name is on your birth certificate. The courtroom is on edge as DNA results are about to be revealed, and the stakes are as high as the Empire State. Emotions run higher than a kite on a windy day as Judge Lake steps in to restore order, turning the court into a no-drama zone and refocusing everyone on the real purpose of the gathering to untangle this genetic knot through DNA testing. The courtroom buzzes with tension as both parties await the DNA results, the suspense thick enough to cut with a knife. The judge emphasizes the weight of the family legacy looming over the proceedings, a legacy wrapped in scandal and mystery. The outcome is next, and it's more dramatic than a season finale cliffhanger. Well, you know what? As much as you have been talking, Charles Lee Jr. this morning, I will say what you just said was so correct. I see you all. It's an emotional day. You're dealing with the legacy of your father. You're dealing with things that adults created, situations adults created in the next generation. Right. And it's not easy. Because right. you don't God. understand how all this happened and what it all means. That's what I'm trying to help you understand. Anticipation reaches a peak with the DNA results on the way, and the atmosphere is as charged as a high-voltage power line. The DNA test results are finally unveiled. It has been determined by this court that Charles Lee Jr. and Carla Lee are not related no! to Patrick Lord, Lee. Lord Jesus! Lord no, Jesus! No, but I love you! We're not doing this. Please, Patrick. Contact, please step over there. That was tough. The court case of Mason versus Malone begins with introductions. The judge, the unflappable Judge Lake, calls the session to order, and the plaintiff, Mr. Mason, jumps straight into the deep end, outlining the case's significance, stating it will determine his future relationship with the defendant, Ms. Malone. Everyone's on the edge of their seats already. Mr. Mason, you say today will determine the future of your relationship with the defendant, Ms. Malone. When you set up a watchdog, keep tabs on Ms. Malone and discover that she had men coming in and out of the house while you were at work. And now you believe one-year-old Avery is not your daughter. Is Ms. Malone, you admit to cheating on your boyfriend, but are positive he's Avery's father. Today, you are hoping the DNA test will restore your relationship. Hold on to your hats. It gets wilder. The backstory of their relationship unfolds. They met online and quickly moved in together, but issues arose when Mr. Mason discovered Ms. Malone sneaking around. This caused him to question her faithfulness further, leading to the current paternity dispute. Just when you think it couldn't get any messier, it does. Results are relevant important to me because um, I really want to know if Avery's really mine or if she isn't. I want to understand the nature of this relationship. Me and Miss Malone actually first met a website. I took her out on a date. So this started out <laughs> as a regular courtship. Yes, You sure. went on a date. Yes, Your Honor. And Ms. Malone had a great relationship in the beginning. Yes, ma'am. You can cut the tension with a knife. Despite their troubled relationship, both parties still live together, albeit off their relationship. This living arrangement creates tension and awkwardness, particularly because Mr. Mason still wants to be there for Avery and hopes for reconciliation. Next up, things spiral even further. Stay tuned. We've been on and off <coughs> for three years now. Right now, we're off. <laughs> Are you living together? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Your Honor. You're off, but you live together. Yes, yes Your Honor. Honor. It's been like that. How's that it's work? A, it's real awkward. There for the kids and because I still love Miss Malone, but, and I was hoping that we could work it out. So that's why today's results are so important because truthfully, when I say your relationship is on the line, I mean, you you all are still living in a home together. Yes, yes Your, Honor. Your Honor. Grab your popcorn. Here comes the kicker. The court discusses the implications of Ms. Malone's actions during the conception period. Ms. Malone acknowledges being unfaithful during this critical time and not using protection, which raises serious doubts about Avery's paternity. As the DNA results loom, the anticipation is through the roof. When you found out you were pregnant, did you tell the other guy it could possibly be his child as well? Yes, Your Honor, I did. When you told Mr. Mason you were pregnant, did you also say to him, and you know because I cheated, it could possibly be the other guy's child as well? Yes, Your Honor. I had to find out about the other guy from waking up out of my sleep, Your Honor. No, Your Honor, he did I, I not. What happened? I overheard a conversation between her and another individual. The plot thickens, and oh, how it thickens. Emotional tensions escalate as Mr. Mason reveals he made a public announcement about Ms. Malone's pregnancy and suggested the child might not be his during a gathering with friends and family, deepening the personal and public nature of their conflict. Brace yourselves. The DNA results are up next. However, I told him as soon as I found out I was pregnant with her, he had so much anger, he decides to announce it with a room full of our friends and my mom. Your Honor, 
I had anger for the simple fact that I was working all these hours trying to provide for my family. And, and she's sneaking with different guys in and out of the house. And so you made an announcement? I just announced that she was pregnant. The judge announces the DNA test results are in. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Mason, are the father. This is a mess. You have to at least be committed to co-parenting and learning how to raise children you do have together well, learning how to be committed to leaving each other alone. And if you're gonna be in a relationship, you need to figure out how to be committed in the relationship. If he doesn't step up, I'll still take responsibility. This introduction sets the stage for a dramatic paternity dispute. Introduction of the case, Taylor versus Orr. The plaintiff, Mr. Taylor, claims he had a brief romantic relationship with the defendant. Ms. Orr, who later informed him of her pregnancy and expressed doubts about the paternity because another man was present at the birth. The tension ramps up quickly from here. Mr. Taylor, you say that you had a whirlwind, two-week romance with the defendant. She called to tell you that she was pregnant with your child. You say another man was at the hospital for the baby's birth and therefore your DNA test will come back negative. Ms. Orr, you say you are insulted that Mr. Taylor is even asking for a paternity test. You feel Mr. Taylor is just trying to dodge his responsibility. Just when you think you've heard it all, the communication breakdown emerges. Dispute over paternity announcement. Ms. Orr contacted Mr. Taylor through Facebook to announce the pregnancy, which Mr. Taylor disputes, claiming the notification was made via a phone call. The disagreement highlights the breakdown in communication following their brief relationship. Watch how the conflict deepens in the upcoming moments. Through Facebook to let him know I'm pregnant. No, she so wait a minute, by the time you find... Let me know she was pregnant. She called me over the phone to... Did you say the baby is yours or could be yours? Could be yours. No. Could be. She yes. has done nothing but sit here and tell me this is no. nothing but my no. child. I have been here. She has ran from the DNA. If it's such doubt and everything, if he is mine, why do you run from a DNA test? I do Mr. not know. Taylor, I'll... As suspicions escalate, the courtroom drama intensifies. Hospital scene and paternity doubts. Discussion of who was present at the hospital during the birth, raising further doubts about the paternity. Ms. Orr had another man in the room, described as a potential godfather, which intensified Mr. Taylor's suspicions. The unfolding story takes a surprising turn next. How did you have time to notify the godfather and not the biological father? A family member contact my friend. You're accusing him of not being there, and yet you are blocking him from being there at the most important moment. I don't understand. Because the nurses was talking to me, at the time, I couldn't really talk to my family members. The nurses then were I, talking to you for a week straight? Telling me everything, pretty much. The controversy over social media posts adds another layer of intrigue. Social media controversy. Mr. Taylor posted pictures with the baby on Facebook, claiming his paternal bond. However, Ms. Orr demanded he remove these photos, causing further conflict and suspicion about her motives and the baby's paternity. Stay tuned for a twist that changes everything. Looks like you do want to be a part of this child's life. If you are the biological father, you intend to be a part of baby Eric's life? I've been here since, like, since I found out about him. I was not raised up with my dad. I did not know of my dad until I was 14 years old. For the fact of she tell me until Eric was a week old, I am unbelievably shocked. I do not know why. I do not know why I deserve it. Genetic traits come into play, adding scientific intrigue to the emotional drama. Genetic characteristics is evidence. Discussion about whether a genetic trait, a crooked penis, could link Mr. Taylor to the baby, with a medical expert clarifying that, while possible, it is not a definitive indicator of paternity. What comes next is a moment everyone's been waiting for. Saying the child had a crooked penis, and I have a crooked penis. She asked me if I had one, I said yes. She said, so how can you deny that this is your son? So she said, All I have to say is I hope nobody exact. brought an exhibit. Your Honor, my son could not get circumcised because he was over 90 degrees. Did you say that your baby has a crooked penis? And that was a point of proof. No, Your Honor, not a point She's of lying, proof. Your Honor. The DNA test results bring a dramatic climax to the intense narrative. DNA test results revealed. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Taylor, you are not the father.